morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Jade McGlynn. I'm a senior researcher at the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. And today we're delighted to be hosting Professor Serhii Plokhi for his webinar on the rise of modern Ukraine, which is the first in a three part series on understanding Ukrainian history. Although we decided to make these lectures public, they actually form part of an introductory module for the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia, which is designed for budding Russia experts and Russianists. But clearly in the shadow of Russia's invasion and horrific war against Ukraine, it's more important than ever to provide resources and access to speakers who can help us analyze and, and understand Russia as it truly is and not simply through Western perspectives. And an important part of doing this, we think, is to include more Ukrainian voices, more knowledge of Ukraine and Ukrainian history, which we will be doing throughout the symposium. But it's also important to place them early on to prioritize the Ukrainian lens, if you will, for, for those aspects that it might help us to identify in, in Russian culture and history that we as, as largely Western Russianists um, could otherwise miss. And who better to do that than Professor Serhii Plokhi. Professor Plokhi is the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. A leading authority on Ukraine, Russia and Eastern Europe, he's published extensively on the international history of World War II and the Cold War. He has won, he and his books have won numerous awards, including the Lionel Gelber Prize for the best English language book on, the interna on international relations and the Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction in the UK. His most recent book, Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disasters, was released by W.W. Norton in May 2022. And now that's more than enough from me. So please let me hand over to Professor Flocky. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation and this introduction, Jade. It's, it's a pleasure to address the audience, uh, both those who are, uh, had a chance to read the um, uh, list of the, of the articles or books that I uh, recommended, or those who didn't have a chance to do that. I will try to um, make my lecture um, accessible to both levels and hopefully interesting as well. Um, the uh, focus, again, historically, traditionally was on Russia, and I certainly welcome that that perspective is now being um, uh, to a degree supplemented and, and, and I would add challenged also by the perspective on the history of the region, including Russian history, from, uh, from outside of borders of today's Russian Federation. And in particular, uh, this uh, enriched, I would say, this, with the uh, perspective on the history of the region coming from Ukraine. Um, I will uh, try to share uh, to share the, the PowerPoint and the, that I have prepared, and we'll see how how it goes. Uh, I hope you can see the the opening slide of uh, the. Um, Today's, today's presentation, today's lecture, as it was mentioned, it's, it's one of three, the rise of modern Ukraine. We'll be talking also about the uh, Soviet uh, Union and again, the role of uh, Russia and Ukraine in, in the creation and then in the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And there will be also a topic on the post-1991 history. So that is, that is basically the plan. And uh, I will uh, start uh, with the, um, let me see how it goes. Okay, now, now it works. Uh, I will start with the um, vision and uh, interpretation or misinterpretation, and I would say abuse of the history of Ukrainian, East European, but also Russian history. Uh, that has been presented to the world in the last few months, or maybe within last year, uh, by uh, the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. And uh, uh, the uh, vision of history that uh, is very much also responsible for the current war, as it was mentioned, horrific war in Ukraine, but also helps to understand the misperceptions that were there in, in Kremlin in particular at the time of the start of the war and also will help to a degree explain 
where why why we see on the front lines in Ukraine the kind of a situation, the kind of the war that is happening today. Uh, Vladimir Putin went on record more than once uh, trying to present his his vision of uh, um, relations or history of relations between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, uh, in uh, last summer, in, in uh, July of 2021, on the Kremlin website, an article was published under the name of Vladimir Putin, and uh, it looks like he is very much really if not the author, then an author of that article uh, on the historical um, unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And the article starts with, the, at the very beginning, the first sentence, the first paragraph really states what is the purpose of writing that article, uh, because Putin states that more than once he had stated in the past that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. And the article, it's a long historical expose uh, trying to prove, trying to prove that point. What really Mr. Putin says when he says that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people, he says that not that the uh, Russians are Ukrainians. He's saying that Ukrainians are really Russians, or in other words, that Ukrainians don't exist uh, historically, um, culturally, and certainly the, the, the Ukrainians are not supposed to exist in the future. And that was uh, the, the, that idea was further, um, I would say, developed uh, in what I consider to be a de facto declaration of war, new war on Ukraine. In his speech that he gave in February of, of 2022 of this year, on the um, um, basically announcing the Russian withdrawal from the Minsk agreements which meant that that was the, 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 the start of the war. It was more of a history lecture than a political statement. And uh, one of the arguments was, again, in line with the arguments that were presented earlier in the article, um, that uh, Ukraine is a legitimate formation now, not only as a nation, but also as a state. The legitimization of the Ukrainian statehood was done now through the um, misuse of uh, the history of the, of the 20th century. And uh, the argument was made that Ukraine is not just an artificial creation, it's a creation of the Bolsheviks, of Lenin in particular. Um, we will deal with that part of the argument uh, later in, in the second lecture, which will deal specifically with the revolution, with the Soviet period. Uh, but uh, the article about the Russians in Ukrainian, or the argument that Russians in Ukrainian being one of the same people, this is something that I will certainly address in, in my today's uh, presentation, in my today's lecture. I want to say that uh, what uh, we saw in this uh, articulation of a particular historical vision and the vision of the history of Russia and Ukraine has been not just something that was created for the outside consumption, uh, outside of Kremlin, I mean, either in Russia or in the West. Uh, that was an item of belief, and maybe still is an item of belief for the uh, um, Russian leader, who is, uh, um, I, I, I have problem with calling this war just Putin's war, it is Russia's war on Ukraine, it's, it's very clear. But he is certainly uh, the person that is most responsible in Russia for launching this war. And it was on the vision of Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people that the expectations were built with regard to the uh, outcome of the military operation, the so-called military operation in Ukraine. The expectation was that it wouldn't last for more than uh, a few days, maybe a couple of weeks at max, the key would fall, Zelensky would, uh, the president of Ukraine, Zelensky would flee, and the uh, Ukrainians would welcome the, the brother Russian people and, and troops with, with flowers. Uh, we know that it didn't happen. And uh, uh, that, that was an enormous blunder, certainly in judgment and assessment of the situation uh, uh, on the Russian part. It was a manifestation of the patriotism and, and heroism and resilience of Ukrainian people 
But uh, for me as a historian, that was also, or has been one of the, um, um, of, the, of the clear signs that a particular vision of history that was presented by Vladimir Putin was, was something that he really believed into and the basis on which he built the plans, the plans for, the, for the current war. Um, <clears throat> the fascination with, uh, with uh, Kyiv, fascination with Ukraine and with Ukrainian history and attempts to deny the uh, independent or even autonomous uh, rights for, 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 for the Ukrainian people or for, for Ukrainian history to exist is not something uh, really new. Uh, new uh, in terms of uh, Vladimir Putin's own ideas or visions. Again, earlier uh, in, in 2015, the second year of the uh, unannounced Russian-Ukrainian war that began in 2014, we see the uh, building of the monument to the Prince of Kiev, Prince uh, Vladimir, or as he known in Ukraine, Volodymyr, uh, at the very coveted place in uh, capital of Russia, in Moscow, next to the uh, Kremlin. A huge statue higher than the statue to the founder of Moscow. Uh, Prince Yuri Dolgoruki has been erected there is a very clear claim certainly for the uh, history of um, Ukraine and for history of Kiev and the medieval state in particular that uh, Prince uh, Volodymyr or Prince Vladimir helped to create and was ruling over the state that is known in historiography as Kievan Rus. And uh, when I said that this is not new for uh, Vladimir Putin's thinking and interpretation of history, I want also to add that this is not new for the uh, Russian imperial historical narrative in general. So from that point of view, Vladimir Putin is not really, again, he maybe adds some additional emphasis and, and additional arguments, but overall, this is, this is the argument and this is the interpretation of history that has been known in Russia at least since the 19th century uh, about the uh, existence of, of Russia as, as a unified state and the a unified state that goes back in terms of its origins all the way to, to uh, Kiev and uh, the um, state that was created uh, at the 9th and 10th century by the uh, Vikings. This is, this is that state, uh, which is, uh, was really going all the way from the Baltic to um, the uh, Black Sea area. Uh, there was a very good reason for uh, that state having that particular shape, because as I mentioned, it was one of the so-called nation building exercises of the Vikings in uh, medieval Europe at that time. What they were trying to do and what they were trying to establish, they were trying to uh, create um, a relatively secure trade routes between the Baltics and the uh, Black Sea and deliver whatever goods they could and first and foremost, the slaves that they would get on the territory of today's Russia, Belarus and Ukraine to the markets in uh, uh, Constantinople, the, the center of the world at that time, the most richest realm. And uh, in the process of that, of, of that um, um, undertaking, uh, they uh, established control over the um, tribes, the local tribes that lived uh, along, uh, along those rivers and along those routes. And eventually out of that came a state which uh, was centered in Kiev, uh, known as Kievan Rus, a medieval state, uh, that uh, really uh, endowed the population or the, the uh, people who um, and, and the countries that would emerge on the territory of the former Kievan state with a number of uh, um, common features, uh, but most uh, importantly, the, the dynasty, which was known as the Rurikid dynasty, with religion, which was Christianity that came from, uh, from uh, Byzantium. Uh, and it became a foundation later, of course, of the Orthodox Church as, as uh, opposed or as separate from the, from the Western Christendom. 
uh, literacy, literary tradition, chronicle writing, and so on and so forth. And all of that, of course, came from and was centered in Kiev, which happened to be the capital, the capital of uh, independent state of Ukraine today. But the idea that uh, the uh, Kiev somehow was, was really very important for, for Russia and the Russian state, it uh, comes into the fore um, in the uh, late 15th century, when the modern Russian state uh, is being formed and created. Uh, out of the territories that were controlled uh, since the 13th century, 13th, 14th, 15th century, by the uh, Mongols, the part of um, territory where today is the core of Russia, was uh, more or less under direct control of the Mongols, unlike the areas of today's Ukraine and Belarus, for example, where that control was looser and it lasted, it lasted not as long. The Russian historical mythology uh, is uh, there to talk about the creation of the Russian state by the um, uh, first uh, ruler of Russia that called himself Tsar. His name was Ivan III or Ivan the Great. He is here portrayed in the 19th century painting. So that creation of the state was uh, formulated as a revolt against the Mongols. And that's that's what you see on this on this painting. The, the representative of the Mongols of the Hans of the Orda is uh, actually the, 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 the attempt to, to continue control over what is today Russia is rejected and they're they're moved they're, they're moved uh, outside of the Tsar's uh, of the Tsar's uh, palace um, in, in humiliation. Well, the, the uh, real story is more complicated because uh, what we see is really Russia and uh, the state around Moscow really rising in prominence. Uh, but the conflict with the Mongols comes not over the uh, subordination to the Mongols or not. The conflict with the Mongols comes over the Russian attempt, the, not the Russian attempt in that particular case, but the attempts of the uh, 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 Grand Principality of Moscow to take control over the Republic of Novgorod, which was a separate entity and a separate state. And in this, ironically, in this battle between the autocracy of Moscow and democratic traditions of Novgorod, the Mongols sided with the Novgorod. <laughs> And was trying, were trying to stop to stop Moscow certainly from taking over Novgorod, which was also a very rich Baltic uh, Republic involved in the Baltic trade. And um, the Mongol intervention failed. So the war happens between Moscow and Novgorod, and uh, the uh, freedom and, and democracy of Novgorod is being destroyed and being crushed. So the Russian state uh, is being formed uh, uh, not so much in the process of revolt against the Mongols, despite the fact that this is part of the story as well, but also as a, a result of the uh, victory of the uh, autocratic principle of the rule of the Moscow um, prince over the, the democratic system of Novgorod. And that would have certainly a major, major impact on uh, on Russian history that I would say reverberate till today. But what is important in the context of uh, Ukraine history and Russia's claim for Kiev is that Ivan III, when he uh, faces the, the uh, Novgorodian army, he makes a very important political and historical claim. He says that Moscow has the right for Novgorod because the Moscow prince is a direct descendant of the rulers of Kiev. He is really part and really the leader of the, this Rurikid dynasty. So the, the story of the origins of the uh, Russian state comes not only in context of revolt against the Mongols, victory of the uh, autocracy over democracy, but also comes with the claim for the rest of the and I'll show you the map for the rest of the Kievan Rus and claim for Kiev. This is the founding myth and the founding mythology of the Russian state as it emerges from the shadow of the Mongol rule 
and starts the process of what Russian Russian uh, historiography calls the gathering of the Russian lands. So just going back to where I started, I hope you, you, there is a thread and you didn't lose it yet. Uh, that certainly explains the origins of the Russian imperial claims for Kiev and also what is happening in Moscow in the last few decades from the building of the uh, monument to the Prince of Kiev uh, Volodymyr of Vladimir at the very center of Moscow, and uh, the claims that were made really in the in the um, in this um, in preparation for the current war, both in the articles and and, and, and uh, the declarations related to the war by by Vladimir Putin. Um, <clears throat> this is this is the story of the expansion of the. Uh, Russian, uh, um, the, the Moscovy and later uh, the Russian Empire in the um, in 16th and 17th centuries. And if you look here, you will see the year 1620, 1639, 1640, 1650, and so on and so forth. So the irony of the situation, despite the fact that the uh, uh, Russian state is built on this foundation of the Kiev mythology, that its right to rule of its dynasty is based on the Kievan origins. Uh, uh, Moscovy reaches Kamchatka sooner than it reaches Kiev here in the West. So really, really the, the, the Moscovy is mm, mm, being formed in the foundations of Russia and foundations of today's the territorial foundations of the Russian Federation are there, uh, there uh, certainly uh, before, before uh, Kiev is, uh, finds itself under, under the Russian control. How that happens, it's, it's an important part of the uh, Ukrainian history. It's also an important part of the Russian history. Uh, here in the, in the center of Kiev, which is now certainly under the attack, from the Moscow, from uh, from the Russian missiles, uh, is uh, the monument to um, the hetman uh, of Ukraine. Hetman uh, comes from the German Hauptmann, the, the commander of the army, the commander of the forces. The name eventually made uh, the term made its name into Ukrainian through Polish. So the leader of the first uh, independent state in Kiev since the time of Kiev and Rus. Bohdan Khmelnytsky, who was a leader of the, of the Ukrainian Cossacks. He led the uprising, which was quite a bloody uprising, and there was a lot of, a lot, a lot of victims on the Polish side, on the Jewish side as well. He led the uprising in 1648 against the rule of the Polish crown, against the rule of the uh, state that was known as Polish-Ukrainian Commonwealth, and by the year 1654, he appealed to the Russian Tsar for, the, uh, for military support. And uh, the, uh, at the, Pryaslav, um, the city of Pryaslav in Eastern Ukraine, which would be, uh, I'm looking where it is exactly on the map, here it is. Uh, there has been a meeting between uh, um, Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky and also the representatives of the Russian Tsar. Uh, and the agreement was reached, uh, which most of the of contemporary historians uh, refer to as a protectorate. So there was a, a established a protectorate of the Tsardom of Moscow over the Cossack state known as the Hetmanate, again, coming in today's historiography, coming from the same term. Hetman, Hetman as the ruler. And uh, that state uh, existed as uh, an autonomous entity within the uh, Moscovite Sardom and then within the Russian Empire up until the last decades of the 18th century. So it's, it's also an interesting development when we look at the uh, Russian move now not to the East, but to the to the west and claim for Kiev. That claim is made not on the on the basis of the conquest, like it is the case with most of Siberia or the Far East. That is there as part of the negotiation process and as part of the of the uh, protectorate. 
that is that is uh, being there or uh, the uh, part of the of the Ukraine known as the Hetmanate, here it is on the map, then as the result of the Polish-Russian war, where the Cossacks were an important part of that story, the border emerges along the Dnieper River, and it's just this part left, bank Ukraine ends up under the uh, Russian control. But being under Russian control meant also for more than 100 years preservation of its own. Uh, rights, freedoms, the uh, independent uh, uh, history writing, independent uh, literary tradition that uh, continues there and exists there for a long period of time. So when things come into the 19th century and modern nations are being formed, and that's, that's where the rise of modern Ukraine really starts and begins, uh, Ukrainians had uh, in, in their relatively recent past at that time, 17th and 18th century, a history of the either independent or autonomous existence, a history of their own state. Now, the Cossacks is not necessarily or exclusively the uh, Ukrainian phenomenon. We know about the Russian Cossacks. There are also some of their formations as auxiliary force was used in the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2014-2015, less so in this more regular uh, war uh, of 2022. Uh, but what is very unique about, about the Ukrainian Cossacks is that unlike the Cossacks of Don or the Cossacks of Amur or the Cossacks anywhere else in the uh, Russian empire, they were able to create a state of their own existed as autonomous entity for more than 100 years and created a culture of their own, including architecture, including the, the uh, um, educational system. I'll just give you one example. In 1659, when uh, the Cossacks change their mind and decide that they don't want under the Russian Tsar to be anymore and try to negotiate a better deal with the Polish king, one of the demands that they put to the, to the Polish king is that the college in Kiev that is known today as Kiev Mohila Academy, which was founded uh, in uh, 1630s, a few years before Harvard, that that college would be raised to the, the status of the college would be raised to the level of the academy. So that, that gives you just some idea about, about the, the political, the, the cultural and other horizons of that, of that state and what is considered to be important and what not important. So th that state created an important political and cultural tradition on the basis of which uh, Ukraine was uh, uh, Ukrainian nation builders of the 19th century. They were able to, to form, to form the, the, the edifice of the of the modern modern Ukrainian nation, but I will I will move to that in a in a few uh, minutes. Before that happened, a very important part for the history of the, the Ukraine, Russia, Eastern Europe, very important uh, um, element for today's sort of historical claims that uh, put forward by Kremlin was the rule of Catherine II. Uh, this is a uh, um, cartoon coming from the late uh, 18th century. It's about the uh, Russian claim for Constantinople, the so-called Greek, Greek project of uh, Catherine II. Uh, out of that project uh, came an attempt uh, to um, um, name the, the, or rename rather, the towns and cities and villages in what is today southern Ukraine and in the Crimea to give them Greek names. That was part of the foundation of the future Byzantine empire to be restored by Catherine II with her grandson, Prince Constantine, to become the new Byzantine emperor. So when you uh, uh, hear today the names uh, where the battles were taking place in the last few a few uh, uh, weeks and few months, like Kherson or Khersonessus, or Melitopol, for example, or if you think about Sevastopol or Yevpatoria um, or Mariupol, 
a lot of that goes back to this to this Greek project of Catherine the Second. So the the attempt was to create already allegedly Greece, allegedly Byzantium, in uh, what is today southern Ukraine, and then claim claim the reunification of the of that Greece, of that Byzantium, with Constantinople, with uh, the, the 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 rest of the Ottoman. Empire. So, what is what is what was happening in real terms? The uh, Greek project fully was never real, uh, realized, never came to fruition. But these are the, the territories that were acquired during the rule of Catherine the uh, Second. They're in today's southern Ukraine, including the Crimea, and then uh, uh, in the west, where the uh, parts of Ukraine here parts of Belarus and parts also of what is today Baltic states were being acquired. So some of you may be noticed reports in the in the news in the last few months that when um, Putin was was meeting with uh, um, Erdogan, Erdogan that uh, I don't remember exactly when that meeting was taking place, but in the background there was a, a, a bus, there was a statue of Catherine II who of course uh, um, is, is known in the Russian history as, as someone under whose rule the, uh, not just the Western territories of Ukraine, Belarus and good part of Baltics were acquired, but also the territories of today's Southern Ukraine that were under Ottoman rule were attached to, to the Russian, to the territory of the Russian empire. What you see today in the happening in the cities and towns like Kherson, uh, which are under Russian occupation. Ukrainian troops are making some advance there. They're apparently 10 kilometers away from, uh, out, for, from the outskirts, from the borderline of Kherson, but Kherson itself is still under the Russian control. And the uh, um, billboards are being put there about uh, uh, Russian history of Kherson with uh, mm, mm, Alexander Suvorov, uh, one of the most celebrated Russian generals, who of course was the general under the Catherine II, was taking part in the uh, in the uh, wars in southern Ukraine, in the uh, conquest uh, of uh, and, and, uh, of uh, parts of, of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland. Uh, he is he is now celebrated as as, as a new symbol, as, as as a new hero of. The city. So there are this, this um, clear links going on in terms of today's Russian historical propaganda to what was happening in uh, that region in uh, the last decades of the in the last decades of the um, 18th century. Uh, so the, the territory has been claimed today on the basis of the uh, 18th century successes in the expansion of the Russian Empire. So the, the narrative is as imperial as it gets. And uh, that's, that's, that's just the beginning. When you look, you move into the, into the 19th century, you see that uh, the uh, imperial narratives that are being formed at that time in the 19th century, they're very much alive, alive today. One thing that happened under the Catherine, under Catherine was, I'll, I'll just go back for, for a sec. One thing that happened under Catherine II was that the ideas of nations started already to uh, come and arrive into the Russian empire. And the ideas of historical legitimacy were really very important. So when Catherine II accomplishes the partitions of Poland, three partitions that bring uh, parts of Ukraine and Belarus under the Russian control, she struck a medal where she says that the, 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 there is a statement that she returned things that were turned, uh, taken away from Russia. So the reference is really to the Kievan Rus. She's trying to restore the unity of the Kievan Rus. So we see history, but also, but also the ideas of nation emerging and, and becoming really very important in the Russian empire. And those ideas based on the model that, okay, there is Russian empire and probably there is one big Russian nation. And that's, that's the way how the empire will be transforming into a sort of a 
not fully nation state, but how it would acquire a new national national uh, identity where it would be not um, would be Russian Empire not just in name but also in in the way how it handles the new challenge that came in the 19th century the challenge of nationalism um, the biggest the biggest problem at that time for the Russian Empire are the Poles which who have a very well developed national project at that time and uh, they um, uh, in the two uprisings that the Poles uh, have in the 19th century, one in the 1830, another in the year 1862, they try to reclaim the Ukrainian and Belarusian territories that were under Polish control for a while. And they appeal to the peasantry, which then produces a pushback from the Russian Empire, who try to prove that Ukraine and Belarus were Russian from the times in memorial, that this Polish control was something temporary. They create, the Russians create institutions like the university in Kiev, where they invite professors and they invite cultural figures to help them to establish this claim that Ukraine and Belarus are really Russian, historically Russian. But they, they face a, mm, phenomenon that they didn't expect that they would uh, that, that they would find this is the image of a poet 19th century romantic poet who by many is considered to be a, a cultural intellectual father of ukraine his name is taras shevchenko he was uh, born as a slave uh, he was trained as an artist in saint petersburg but he became the most uh, he made his name really as a poet. A poet who, unlike his another uh, Ukrainian predecessor, Nikolai Gogol, Gogol wrote in Russian, Shevchenko made a conscious decision to write, to write in Ukrainian. Uh, Shevchenko was uh, arrested in 1847 as part of the group of the intellectuals around Kiev University who had, uh, from the point of view of the Russian imperial authorities, a strange idea. They uh, were not to claim that um, Ukraine is not uh, Polish, but is Russian, but their message was different. Ukraine is not, is not Polish, but it is not Russian either. It is, it is, a, separate, it is a separate nation. And uh, like, like any other uh, nation uh, in East Central Europe, who, the nations that didn't have their state, the argument is based on basically cultural foundations, the language. Here you see the uh, uh, dialects, linguistic dialects in the territories that used to be part of the Kievan Rus belong today to Ukraine, Belarus, and, and, and partially Russia. And uh, uh, there is a diversity of the dialects, but also they fall, at least in the mind of the um, linguists of the 19th century, they fell into three different categories, Great Russian, White Russian, or Belarusian, and Little Russian, or Ukrainian. And uh, when uh, the Russian intellectuals at the beginning of the 19th century uh, were really fascinated uh, about the, 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 the mythology of the origins of the Russian state in Kiev. And they were traveling to Kiev to find the, the roots, the origins of uh, Russia. They were struck by the fact that they couldn't understand the language that the locals were speaking to, to them and speaking to each other. So suddenly in the 19th century with this attention to the people to culture to language the model of the russian empire and big russian nation and it is all the same starts crumbling because once the idea of language and culture and nation is introduced it becomes clear that historical mythology that goes back to the 14th century the origins of the dynasty the origins of the state and so on and so forth they don't work anymore it's a major, major threat to the Russian Empire, and many Russian intellectuals think that this is a major threat to the very idea of the Russian nation. At the time when 
the, the, the entire world, Europe in particular, really jump on this on this bandwagon of uh, uh, at least cultural nationalism, political nationalism. The state of Italy is being formed uh, in that way. The state of Germany is being formed out of separate states on the idea of the unity of language, idea uh, of the unity of the culture, and so on and so forth. This is a major threat, the rise of this nation states, a major threat to the empires, including the Russian empire. And they, they understand that, they realize that. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to use whatever means that they have at their disposal to arrest the development of Ukrainian and by extension, Belarusian Bel movements as well, to save the construct of the big Russian nation that goes back into the 14th century to save this mythology. And uh, uh, this is this is the um, uh, um, image of Alexander II, uh, one of the uh, major reformers in the in the uh, Russian Empire of the um, ever, but in the 19th century in particular. He was uh, assassinated. Uh, he is responsible for reforming the Russian army, for reform the judicial system, uh, the so-called period of great reforms that came to Russia in the second half of the 19th century with his rule. But he is also there to crush the development of non-Russian national movements. Under him, two special restricts one, uh, two special uh, edicts, one signed by him personally, were issued prohibiting the publication in Ukrainian language of any works, excluding the works of folklore and prohibiting the import into on the territory of the Russian empire, any works published in the Ukrainian language. The, 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 the decisions have a major, major impact on the development of Ukrainian uh, uh, nation and national project, on the project of the uh, bringing literacy to the, to, 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 to the peasantry, Ukrainian peasantry. And it lasts for over 40 years, being really, um, really uh, canceled or the, 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 the policy was changed and the publications were allowed in Ukrainian language only during the revolution of 1905. The first prohibitions were introduced in 1863 and then in the 1870s, emperor himself goes there and signs a special, special edict. So uh, at the same time, when it comes to the realm of history, we see the elaboration on the same old theme of the one and indivisible Russian state now with the idea that it's one and indivisible Russian nation. The textbooks are written for the, for the schools where the uh, uh, model is introduced that, okay, there was a one unified Russian nation during the Kievan times. It was Prince Vladimir who was the, 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 the father of that nation. The country and the nation was then divided by the foreign forces from the Mongols to the Poles to the Lithuanians. And the mission, the Russian mission, the mission of the Russian empire in the 19th century is the reunification of the Russian lands. Look at the pronouncements of Vladimir Putin today. Look at his articles, look at his statement. It is this 19th century model that is being uh, reused again and again in this in, 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 in this uh, take on the on, on the history of Russia and Ukraine. The, the take is, of course, that as has been proven by the first few months of this war, really don't reflect correctly not only history but certainly yet in the in the direct conflict with the with the uh, realities on the ground. Now. Fighting Ukrainian uh, rise of the Ukrainian uh, national uh, project meant also not only uh, um, suppression, that meant also to a degree the um, certain attempts to accommodate 
the, that project. So the model was uh, adjusted of the Russian nation. The idea was that, well, it is one nation, it is united, but there are three different tribes, great Russians, little Russians, and, and white Russians or Belarusians. Yes, they have different dialects and they have some cultural distinctions and so on and so forth. But politically, there is one nation and there should be one nation. So that there is, uh, to a degree, um, you, 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 you allow for certain differences, but you also arrest the development of those cultural and national projects uh, very early on. So until the end of the Russian Empire, Ukrainian language was never, ever allowed in the schools. The publications were allowed in 1905, but in the schools, the language was not taught until 1917, 1918. And uh, certainly, certainly the, the, the political parties and so on and so forth uh, were, were banned. Again, that's true not only for the Ukrainian parties, for any, any parties that opposed the uh, the authoritarian regime at that time. So, but uh, one thing, one thing that uh, certainly was there was an attempt to preserve this imagined, imagined unity of the Russian nation. Let me see what is happening with Skarin. Uh, okay. uh, I have probably uh, maybe five minutes more or 10 minutes and, and then we can we can move to, to, to questions. There was one thing that um, in terms of geopolitics of the 18th century, 19th century that um, helped Ukraine to preserve their identity and to continue to develop um, Ukrainian national project uh, irrespective of the um, prohibitions that were introduced in the Russian Empire. That fact was that the Ukrainian territories were uh, divided uh, in the 19th century between two empires, which were most of the time um, in competition with each other. So the one was the Russian Empire, another was the Habsburg Empire that in the 1860s reinvented itself as a dual monarchy, as Austria-Hungary. In the 18th century, when the thinking about the nations and nationality didn't penetrate yet the minds of Catherine II or the rulers of any other empires, as the result of the partitions of Poland, one part of Ukraine, and you can see it here, it's Galicia, but it's also uh, parts of Transcarpathia and, and Bukovina later, ended up uh, within the borders of uh, Austria-Hungary. Galicia, part of Austria and Bukovina, and today's Transcarpathia is part of the Kingdom of Hungary eventually. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, um, uh, with the ethno-national thinking, becoming part of the of the thinking of the courts, Catherine II was trying to um, renegotiate the deal. There was a contest for another part of Ukraine called Volhynia between Austria, Hungary and, and Russia. And Catherine II managed to keep to keep uh, Volhynia as part of the Russian Empire. But uh, part was outside of the Russian Empire. And in the 19th century, you see certainly the rise of the, of the national movements in, in Austria-Hungary as well. I really don't have much time to go into the dynamics of the nation building in that part of Ukraine. I will be more than happy to answer the questions that you might have. But one thing that we see by the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, is that the Ukrainian national project emerges victorious in that part of Ukraine as the most dynamic, as the most influential political force. And it is there that the Ukrainian writers who couldn't publish their work in the Russian empire were publishing their works. It is there that the first, first leader of independent Ukraine in 1918 Professor of History Mikhail Hrushevsky, my chair at Harvard, is named after him. 
He comes from the Russian part of Ukraine, but he got his position as a professor of history at the University of Lviv, then Lemberg, University of Hungary. And that's where he created a master narrative of Ukrainian history that challenged the master narrative of the Russian imperial history. In 1904, he published an article which was called on the traditional history of uh, on the traditional scheme of Russian history. Traditional scheme was imperial history, where he put put forward a Ukrainian claim for for a different non-imperial history of Ukraine, based not on the history of the dynasty, not based on the history of the state or state institutions, but based on the history of the people. So language, culture, people. They're at the center of the Ukrainian national narrative, how it was created by Hrushevsky at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. And what we see till today in the 21st century, still the competition, at least on a certain level, between the imperial narrative based on the history of the state and imperial conquest and Ukrainian national narrative that is based on the history of the people. Again, it's, it's a little bit simplification, but at least when you look at the, at the level of, 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 of propaganda, at the level of the key historical arguments, the way how they get into the media, the contest is still going on between the imperial narrative and the, the populist narrative, the, the national narrative of the late 19th and 20th century. And, and now to conclude uh, with the events of World War I. World War I was the war that was started by the empires in defense of the, in defense of the empires. So Austria-Hungary starts the war on Serbia trying to stop the rise of the Slavic national movements within the borders of Austria-Hungary. And uh, then, then the rest is history, of course, other, others join in and so on and so forth. So the uh, war leads to the, to, the, to the fall of the empires. Um, Austria-Hungary is gone. The Ottoman Empire is gone. The Russian Empire loses, loses a lot of its territories in the West being reconstituted by the Bolsheviks under a different name after under a different border, uh, banner. But there was, there was a moment in the spring of 1915 when the Russian imperial dream of reunifying the lands of the Kievan Rus was seemingly very close to the, to, to the realization. This is a propaganda postcard and poster coming from 1915 time of the World War I, where you see the Russian soldiers being welcomed by the uh, Ukrainians in the city of Lviv and sharing together Easter, Easter bread during the Easter celebration. Uh, that's, that's the model that certainly was envisioned by Mr. Putin and others when they launched the special military operation in Ukraine in February of this year. But it was a propaganda poster back then in 1915. It continued to be a vision, uh, uh, misleading vision, which turned out to be impossible, impossible to reach for the for the invading for the invading army. The uh, successes of the Russian arms in Lviv were short-lived. By 1915, of course, the Russian army was was in. Uh, retreat, which eventually leads, of course, to the uh, to the um, revolution, and this is this is image. I'll con uh, conclude with it. This is the image of the removal in Kiev of the monument to Pyotr Stolypin, the Russian uh, prime minister of the beginning of the um, 20th century, who was who was assassinated uh, in Kiev before before the start of uh, World War One. But that's already uh, not a different story. It's a continuation of the story that I started, but this is a topic and subject for um, our discussion when we, when we meet again. And uh, now I hope that I didn't bore you to death with, with all this attempt to, to cover in 40, 45 minutes at least 1,000 years of the history of the region. There's a lot of maps, a lot of names, a lot of developments, but I am certainly I will be more than happy to um, 
provide clarification if, if it needed or answer whatever questions you might have uh, during this, this hour today's talk. Uh, thanks again, and I stop sharing my, my screen. Thank you so much, Professor Flohi. Certainly, nobody would be bored to death. It was it was a fascinating and and very uh, ridiculously coherent and quick. <laughs> um, in in its travel through these through these centuries. Um, if anybody from the audience does want to put their from the public audience does want to put their questions into the Q and A, um, I will try and get to those um, as much as I can. But first of all, we'll go to questions from. Well, I say first of all, we will first go to questions from the MSSR, uh, from the Monterey Symposium Fellows. However, I'm going to be really, really cheeky and um, get completely um, take advantage of my position um, here as, as sort of introducer and ask you a question first, if that's OK, Professor. Um, so my question is, um, if you could just speak a little bit about the importance of the of, of writers um, for the development of the of the language, my Ukrainian teacher always tells me these interesting sort of tidbits about how, say, Lyasa Ukrainka came up with Bozhevilny, which is the word for for crazy or, or mad. And I just wonder what important what was the importance um, of their role to the development of of Ukrainian as as not just a language in the villages. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 the short answer is that uh, they, they played a very important role, which is, which is difficult to overestimate. But I, I, I wanted to um, use this question to, to also comment on, uh, on, the, on the role of um, gender and women in particular in the Ukrainian movement. You started with Lesya Ukrainka. Um, a major, major figure in Ukrainian literature. And before that, there was another a woman named um, Markov of Chok. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, Ukrainian uh, historical narratives, I was talking about Hrushevsky. Uh, but the, the, the first uh, new textbook of uh, Ukrainian history was uh, also written by a woman. And um, I, I uh, don't really know why, why women turned out to be so prominent in, in Ukrainian uh, culture, in Ukrainian literature, in Ukrainian history writing. But one of the, uh, one of the possible explanations is that uh, really what you see with the Ukrainian culture, with the Ukrainian history, with Ukrainian literature, in the context of the Russian Empire is their really uh, marginalization by the, by the official narratives and institutions. And uh, uh, the, you, you see that um, that's, that's where um, women who, again, couldn't get high education and so on and so forth were to a degree getting a better chance of, of, of uh, establishing themselves in that uh, not entirely underground, but certainly very marginalized by the empire field of the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. But and again, th th this is a hypothesis, but this is something that I'm thinking about and trying to explain why, why we're having this both in Ukrainian literature, in Ukrainian culture, and even in Ukrainian historiography, where you look at the fathers of, of, of other nations, they're just exclusively fathers. And you see so many mothers of the Ukrainian nation in, in, in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. But uh, turning to the, to the, to the question um, about, about writers in general, uh, this, is, this is another, another uh, absolutely unique phenomenon that should be studied. Uh, we, we see a, a very, very unusual situation where most of the writers are in Eastern Ukraine, in Central Ukraine, in Russian part of, of, the, uh, of, of, of Ukraine, the Russian controlled by the Russian Empire. But as I said, their publications appear in print only in Austria-Hungary. So their readers are in a different country. And uh, Galicians, they, they produce good writers of their own. Ivan Franko is one of them, but still the, the canon of the Ukrainian literature comes from this Eastern Ukrainians. So um, what does it do to the, to, 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 to the culture, to, to, to the tradition of writing? Uh, the writers live in the cities that are uh, basically Russian speaking very often, but they write in, in Ukrainian. 
uh, another, another very interesting phenomenon that you write for your own people in the environment. So, so it's almost like internal immigration on a different level. Uh, by any, by any definition, not, not uh, uh, very, very uh, normal or very, very uh, favorable conditions for the creation of a literature, language, establishing connections and ties between writers and audience. But there is, there is a miracle of, 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 that, of that culture still uh, thriving on a certain level and, and, and most importantly surviving, surviving those prohibitions. Um, without, uh, without uh, certainly a writer uh, and, and people who are writing, who are producing those things, it would be impossible to imagine that happening. Clearly, with Ukrainian writers, more than maybe with any other category of writers in the, in the really imperial context, authoritarian context, without ability for political, political um, mobilization and activities, they perform the role of more than just a writer. It's also a political, political figure and to a degree a political, political leader. Uh, I mentioned that most of the writers who are part of this uh, Ukrainian can come from uh, uh, Russian empire and less so from Galicia. And maybe one of the explanations is that in Galicia since 1848, there are political parties, there are freedom of the activities, there are freedom of assembly, uh, where you, mm, there were other ways to communicate important messages outside of the literature, but there is virtually none in the Russian empire. Again, this is true for the Ukrainian culture, this is true for any, any, any other culture, any other literature. Yeah, I would yeah, I'd definitely like to read a, um, a PhD thesis on <laughs> that sort of the dialogue, I suppose, or between, between the two parts. Um, let me now, I've taken up enough time, let me now um, ask any of our Monterey Symposium fellows um, if they would like to just raise their hand, if, if they have a question, and then I will um, allow you, well, this sounds very deep story, I'll then allow you to talk um, according to the button. Um, so Daniel, you have a question. There we go. Uh, hello, Professor Plochia. Thank you so much for the Daniel, lecture. please, please, would you just interrupt? Uh, sorry, interrupt. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Please, would you just introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Daniel Offman. I'm uh, part of the Summer Symposium on Russia Studies, and I'm also a producer at the World Public Radio Program. And uh, my question is about uh, a moment from uh, one of the readings from uh, Alexei M Miller's uh, Ukrainian question. There's a moment where he describes uh, Bunyan uh, kind of comparing the Russian serf uh, or the Russian, yeah, the Russian serf with the Ukrainian serf and almost saying that the Russian serf is kind of, you know, has a torn shirt, is downtrodden in a way versus the honorable uh, Ukrainian serf or peasant, um, not serf, uh, peasant, uh, and uh, Miller describes the Ukrainian peasant in this case, kind of in Bunin's eyes, being a more authentic version of, of Russian. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that notion at the time coming from writers or other contemporaries of, of Bunin and, and what that meant to them that a Ukrainian peasant might be a more authentic Russian in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, thanks. And uh, uh, yes, the, the uh, um, uh, Alexei Miller's book is, 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 is a very important book in terms of um, really documenting the, the, this, the rise of the idea of the big Russian nation that includes Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, and also the ways in which the, the Ukrainian national project was arrested. Um, in terms of, of uh, authenticity of um, Ukrainian peasantry uh, in, in Bunyan and in, in works of other, uh, other writers uh, around that time, one theme that is very obvious there is that um, the tendency in the Russian uh, culture circles, certainly uh, go back to Kiev and think about Kiev as the origins of Russia. So that's why, just by definition, if you belong, if you have this uh, uh, frame of your mind, you go to Kiev and you are pre-programmed to see uh, the real origins of Russia and, and everything has to be more authentic 
more authentic Russian because you are subscribed to a particular type of the of the historical of the historical narrative. Then, in uh, terms of how how the, the the peasants look and and, and how they, they carry themselves, uh, there are uh, there are um, two additional two additional factors to consider. One of them is that. Uh, the uh, serfdom as such was a uh, phenomenon in Ukraine that uh, didn't define really the um, peasant, peasant culture. Uh, the uh, Khmelnytsky uprising of the mid 17th century put an end to any form of serfdom and personal, personal dependence, which is certainly not part of Russian history where, where there is the rise of, of the uh, number of people who were inserted. Um, what you see then is that the open steppe border allows the peasants actually to continue moving south and avoiding, avoiding uh, serve them even when Catherine II tries to bring it back in the 18th century, in the late 18th century. Uh, by the time the serfdom is uh, abolished in 1861, there are still uh, the uh, Ukrainian villages in southern Ukraine on the Azov Sea, Black Sea that, that never saw serfdom as such. So that that gives you gives you a very different different idea what how peasants thought about themselves, how they behaved, how they looked like. And uh, uh, finally, we are talking about the uh, Ukrainian Black. Uh, and the, the very rich, very rich uh, um, uh, agri agricultural environment where the peasants uh, were doing better than peasants in Central Russia in terms of the way how they look. So you, you have this historical, social, cultural, economic reasons that uh, really put, put Russian and Ukrainian peasant in, in different boxes or in different columns at least uh, um, uh, but uh, again, the, the, the Russian imperial narrative is still functioning there. Okay, you go to Kiev to find to the mother of the, of the, the Russian city, so called. You, you see that reference in Putin again to find the, the authentic origins of the Russian people, and each time you, you fail. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to go to the next question now, um, which is from Adam Lenton. So again, Adam, if you could just introduce yourself, then ask your question. Hello. Um, thank you very much, Professor. My name is Adam Lenton. Um, I'm also a, um, a fellow this year at Monterey Symposium and a PhD candidate at George Washington University, um, working on Russia's ethnic republics. Um, so uh, the question I have in the takeaway from the uh, Miller reading especially is a problem of projecting national concepts and boundaries into the past to legitimize contemporary nationalist narratives and claims and you know the example of Putin statements are the most recent and dangerous of these um, and my question is that it, it's sometimes perhaps tempting to, to counter these through alternative nationalist narratives that assume presence of a homogeneous nation moving through history to the present day and um, yeah, I, I was just curious as a historian, how do you navigate this tension between the need to educate against these uh, these you know, toxic nationalist narratives, but also the need to avoid um, sort of simplifying uh, history itself and especially the history of the nation. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for this question. And this is, this is a huge challenge, right? Uh, it's one thing when you, right for for your colleagues and uh, it's it's another set of challenges or additional challenges how to write for a broader audience especially in the in the atmosphere where the the history become has been weaponized and and how to do that uh, in the way that um, you wouldn't be kicked out from your from your uh, guild as a historian but by your colleagues um, and at the same time, uh, provide provide some educational value to the to, to the public at large. And it, it is a huge challenge. How, how I I uh, navigate that uh, with difficulty. <laughs> it's always it's it, it, it's always um, uh, again a very 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 challenging uh, very challenging task. Uh, I uh, wrote the, the book on the history of Ukraine, which is called The Gates of Europe. 
the history of Ukraine, where I was trying really to uh, present present our today's understanding of uh, history, or in particular history of Ukraine, to, to broader audience. But uh, in, in very basic terms, what we have uh, today uh, in case of history of Ukraine or, or history of most of the of the nations that appeared on the uh, on the map of the world in the last 100, 120 years, the majority of them were not on the map 100 years ago, is that you, you are writing a history of the country, you are writing history of the territory. The boundaries of that country and that territory is very much defined by the ethnographic boundaries, at least in most cases, because that was and continues to be the main legitimizing principle for the existence of the state. The model that goes all the way back to German uh, uh, nation building to Herder and so on and so forth. And uh, then at least my approach, you, you take this territory, which is defined by ethnographic boundaries, maybe not of today, but of the way when the, the national project comes into existence. And then you try to be as open-minded as you can in writing the history of, the, of that territory. And so the ethnographic principle is already there. It's built in terms of how you, you create your map, what you write about. That's, that's what people who live on that territory want to know about that. That's what people who don't live there want to know about that territory. Where did it come from? What, what the origins are? Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's the way how I try to balance, uh, to, to balance the two, not falling into the, into the nationalist uh, necessarily narrative but also recognize the importance of uh, nation and, and national projects in the reformatting the map of the world from one that was dominated by empires to the one that is dominated by nation state or nationalizing state or at least states that don't have imperial, uh, imperial uh, foundations or imperial mission. Russian Federation, unfortunately, is the one that still has that certain, certain vision and that, and that uh, uh, that um, um, factor is a dominant factor in, in defining history, but also looking at the future for that history. Thank you. Um, now, the next question is from Nils. Neil, sorry. Um, Nils, are you there? Yeah, I, I'm here. Uh, I hope uh, it's discernible. Yeah, uh, first, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for the uh, for the lecture. Just for int introduction terms. Uh, I'm, a, I'm Niels and I'm an MTI fellow this year at um, the Middlebury Institute and a final year postgraduate student at University College London International Relations. So excuse me when I'm coming a bit from the IR. Uh, perspective. Um, what I was curious about is it was both discernible in your um, writing that was um, given to us in the syllabus of uh, Miller's writing is the certainly following the Anderson argument of, of the in-group uh, and out-group dynamics when uh, in Ukrainian nationalism. And what I was uh, what I was curious about is um, if you could give a, give your views on how the certain dynamics between the Polish uh, outgroup and the Russian outgroup changed in the certain trajectory for Ukrainian nationalism, because reading what was written about uh, Taras Shevchenko, it seemed both were, um, were pretty equal in, in terms of uh, constituting the outgroup. But how did that change, perhaps in, in the 20th century or until today? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for this question. Returning to Shevchenko, so and and to what to, to what I said in very general terms, in a sense that um, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, articulation of the Ukrainian project um, uh, in the 1840s is produced by the people who were employed by the Russian Empire to fight the, the Polish claims for, for the, the, the ter Western territories of the Russian Empire. So, and um, they uh, they shared with the with the Russian imperial narrative a lot in terms of considering the, the Poles as uh, as uh, certainly main main challenger. Uh, uh, so that's that's certainly is there, and uh, they're not they're not trying to adjust to a particular 
part of the Russian imperial narrative, that, that, that becomes also part of the, of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian thinking and Ukrainian national project. But there is one very important factor is that the Polish national mobilization and the Polish national movement is also used as a model for the, for the Ukrainian one. Uh, the key text that was produced by uh, the group which Shevchenko was part of, the Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood, and Alexei Miller writes about that at length, uh, was called the Books of Genesis of Ukrainian People, authored by um, the professor of history at Kiev University, uh, Mykola Kostomarov, who is really an intellectual father of, of modern Ukrainian nation. Uh, but when uh, that, uh, that uh, work of his was uh, confiscated, when he was arrested, he was quite successful in convincing the, um, in convincing the investigators, and again, Miller writes about that as well, that uh, that was a work of, um, written by some Paul, by Poles, because the, 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 some of the basic ideas and foundations were really very close to Adam Mickiewicz and, and, and his messianism with regard to the, to, to, to the Polish nation. So that's, that's in terms of the relations with the Poles, uh, but uh, they, they, really, uh, they really become, uh, become a, a secondary, a secondary factor for the uh, um, Ukrainian national movement in the uh, in, um, in eastern and central part of Ukraine within the Russian Federation. So this this uh, uh, looking at the at the uh, poles as the major threat as the major challenges uh, becomes becomes much less important, and Russia is imagined uh, and, and takes takes this role. It's a very different story in Austria-Hungary where the Poles still consider, uh, being considered up until the certainly mid 20th century as the main threat to the Ukrainian national project. At the time of the um, revolutionary wars, uh, we see a very strange situation where the Eastern Ukrainians are making deal with the newly emerged Polish state at the expense of their West Ukrainian Galician Galician um, uh, brothers or partners. When the Galicians actually make a deal with the uh, army, white army of General Dimikin, uh, not, not, not fighting for Kiev, for example. So the question that, that, that you ask, it has a complicated answer because depending on the part, imperial part of Ukraine, the outer groups and their importance, was different and it would also change over time. So by the mid 20th century, of course, the Poles disappear uh, completely out there and Russia takes, uh, Russia and Russians take this role in both Eastern and Western Ukraine now within the borders of the Soviet Union. Thank you. Now the final question from our fellows and then I want to take a couple of the questions from, from the Q&A that I think are interesting and perhaps especially relevant right now. Um, I'm going to go to Meredith now. Meredith, you should be able Hi. to say hello. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, excellent. Um, so hi, I'm Meredith Furbish. I am also a fellow with the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia uh, this year. And I was wondering about sort of artistic expressions of uh, Ukrainian nationalism in the um, imperial period. Um, one of my favorite paintings is Dunaya Noch na Dnipre. Um, by uh, Arkhip um, Kuinji, and he was born uh, in the territory of modern Ukraine. And I understand there's some controversy about whether the painting should be in a Russian museum where it currently is, or whether it should be um, moved to Ukraine, at least before the war. Um, and so I was wondering sort of with the restrictions on Ukrainian language works, did was there sort of a movement um, in terms of like vis visual arts um, to express a sort of national identity? Sure. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Ex uh, excellent question. Uh, one thing that happens with the uh, prohibition of the publication in Ukrainian language is really uh, um, 
uh, maybe not exactly flourishing, but certainly certainly a development, relatively successful development in, of Ukrainian theater. Because depending on the time, the performances sometimes were banned, sometimes were not banned. The bans were uh, lifted earlier than on the publications. So a lot of, of this effort goes, goes into, into the theater. And uh, eventually, by the, by the beginning of the 20th century, we see a very clear, clear manifestation of that Ukrainian national, uh, national identity and, uh, in, in uh, visual arts. And uh, Vasil Krachevsky, very talented figure who eventually produces the um, mm, 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 is, is, is one of the, of the authors of the Ukrainian Court of Arms and so on and so forth. He's there, he's also a very important architect, builds a building of the Zemstvo in, in Poltava. Uh, earlier in the, in the um, uh, last decades of the, uh, of the 19th century, there is a lot of the manifestation of the, of the folkloric elements and celebration either of Ukrainian nature or celebration of uh, uh, Ukrainian folkloric tradition. Uh, the big question is uh, where, where exactly does, uh, do, do those work belong? Because the uh, painting that, that the, the most expensive painting in the history of the Russian Empire, which was bought by Emperor Alexander III, was uh, produced or was painted by the uh, by the native of Ukraine, uh, uh, Ilya Repin. Uh, the Zaporozhians writing a letter to the uh, Ottoman Sultan. And of course, uh, Emperor bought it as a manifestation of Zaporozhians as the symbol of the Russian history uh, in this popular, popular incarnation. When for most in Ukraine, it was of course perceived as the, the, the symbol of Ukraine and Ukrainian culture. Um, so with Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, activists divided between the proponents of the Ukrainian project and the little Russian project where you celebrate local, local culture, folklore, but still consider yourself to be part of a bigger Russian nation. It's very difficult, not just with the Kuinji, but with Zvepin and others, to put somewhere in, into a column of exclusive identity or exclusively Ukrainian art versus broader imperial, Russian imperial art. But that changes in the 20th century, and uh, people like, uh, people like um, uh, uh, Vasil Krachevsky is, is one of those. By the time of the revolution, 1917, 1918, you see that a lot of ethnic Ukrainians who were uh, like uh, Rehori Narbu, who made their name in the uh, Russian imperial space, including cultural space, they come back to Kiev to found the Ukrainian uh, Art uh, Academy and become major figures in the creation of now very clearly Ukrainian art not just Slavic, not just Russian, not just Imperial. Uh, so very, very we, we see these roots which are quite ambiguous. Again, interest in nature, interest in, in culture, interest in embroidered shirts and so on and so forth that can be still interpreted in a number of ways. By the start of the 20th century, there is a very clear uh, divisions and identification of the artists as being Ukrainian or not. And, then, uh, of course, 1917, the creation of auton autonomous Ukraine and independence, independent Ukraine gives additional boost to that, to that development. Thank you very much. I'm now going to just read out two questions. Um, well, I'll sort of summarize them from, from the audience Q&A. Um, uh, so one of the questions is um, sort of how also how the borders of Ukrainianness were established. Um, so, you know, talking about sort of going from Volhynia all the way to, to the Kuban, sort of why isn't Baronish still Ukrainian, this, this sort of idea. Um, and then another, that's my spin, sorry, that's not what the question asked. Um, and then um, another question is about um, the importance of language, um, including in the, current, um, in the current conflict, and sort of more about the origins and history of the Ukrainian language, and, and, and perhaps within, uh, with a reference to Putin's claim, um, you know, of protecting Russian speakers um, and, and 
and this sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, the, the, the borders of Ukraine, ethnographic borders of Ukraine, uh, this is the product of creation of those maps is the um, outcome of the efforts of cartographers of the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century working on the both sides of the Russian Austrian border a number of books by Steven Siegel, whom I recommend very highly uh, discuss this this uh, particular areas and subjects and look at the, at the specific cartographers and their ideologies and their training and they're thinking in those terms. Um, now, um, the, the, the problem with using the ethnographic boundaries is always that, okay, it's, it's almost impossible to create a state and, and drew the borders on the map that would make sense because the, the um, uh, groups speaking those languages would be spread widely and uh, there would be en enclaves within um, other uh, uh, linguistic groups. This is certainly has been the case with Ukraine, given the um, peasant immigration uh, in the um, 18th and the beginning of the 19th century to combine. Um, uh, for, for a certain period of time, Ukrainians constituted the majority and then at least half of the population of combined within the Russian Federation. You look at the Far East, the so-called Zeleny Klin, the settlements in, in the Far East where there was block settlements of Ukrainian peasants. Again, that's, that's another enclave. And uh, you go into the, into the um, uh, areas of Voronezh, again, the same, the same story. Uh, it's very easy or relatively easy to see and define whether this is a Ukrainian speaking village or Russian speaking village, when you look at Ukrainian uh, Russian borderlands. Um, there was a recent, recent report, and well, at least not so recent, from the war of 2014, 2015, about the uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, soldier uh, giving an interview and responding to one of the questions and saying, okay, we just found ourselves in the village in Luhansk area, in Luhansk region, we couldn't figure out what village it was. The idea is that normally you can figure out, you, you, you immediately recognize where there is Ukrainian or where is Russian village in terms of the linguistic practices. Because that areas were settled already uh, 16th, 17th century, with this linguistic dialects being quite established and, and certainly belonging to different groups. It's almost impossible to draw the border between uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian villages. There are transitional dialects, the dialects that are there from the time of Herodotus, from the times in memorial. This is not like two linguistic maps, masses moving closer. So this is, this is a long way to say something very clear and very simple that uh, it's it's uh, um, difficult to to create a border of a state on the basis of the linguistic uh, uh, languages and, and dialects. Um, so what what gets into the into the picture is of course uh, the the politics, the war, and administrative boundaries. Because when you look at the claims that would be made by the autonomous and then independent Ukrainian states or governments in the 1917, 1918, very often they would be based on the basis of existing borders between the gubernias. Sometimes main exceptions for the borders of Povit or the county. You look at the current war uh, and Russian aggression against Ukraine. And this is again and again and again the, the battle now for uh, uh, Severodonetsk is there extremely important because uh, Russia allegedly wants to get to the borders of the Luhansk region. Who cares where the administrative border created during the Soviet Union of Luhansk uh, region is or the Netsk region is or not? But that still today continues to be a major military goal of the Russian Federation. This is just to stress you an importance of the obscure administrative borders and boundaries 
that continue to be important today for whatever reason. And certainly they were, they were extremely important in, in uh, the um, 20th century or 19th century. And certainly they were not based on the ethnographic principle. Um, so that's, that's, that's a comment on the language and, and the creation, uh, creation of the, of the um, Ukrainian state and Ukrainian, Ukrainian territorial uh, um, claims in, in the 19th, 20th, and, and 21st century. In terms of the, of the language and its importance today, uh, the, the uh, certainly part of the important part of the propaganda has been about the liberation of the Russian speaking Ukrainians. And uh, I think that in the same way how it is the case with history. Uh, it was not just a propaganda ploy, it was an item of faith on the part of the uh, ideologues of, of the war and within the Putin in particular. Uh, no, that was one of the foundations for the expectations that everyone would be welcoming um, Russian troops, in particular in the, in the Russian speaking areas of, of Ukraine. But what we see is those, those areas that have been uh, bombarded, destroyed, Mariupol, more than 40% of the population there before the war, not just Russian speakers, they're ethnic Russians. The second largest city in Ukraine, in Ukraine Kharkiv, is being bombarded and bombarded again because the Russians put, put, push the, 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 the front line closer to the city now, can reach it again with the, with the artillery. So it's, 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 it's a Russian speaking city. And uh, the uh, images that I already referred to coming from Southern Ukraine, from Kherson, uh, with people marching against the Russian tanks with the Ukrainian banners, this are, if not all, 90% Russian speakers. And the, the whole idea of need for being liberated is, is, is um, uh, something that is certainly ridiculed in, in, in Ukrainian media and is something that is that is uh, looked at as, as, as a really uh, sick joke. Um, Ukraine survived in 2014, 2015, and continues to survive today by uh, uniting across the linguistic, cultural, and religious lines. And uh, the, the symbol of Ukrainian resistance today, like it is in Ukraine, like everywhere in the world, is a uh, um, Volodymyr Zelensky, um, ethnic Jew coming from the Russian speaking family and, and Russian speaking, predominantly Russian speaking city. Um, so again, it's, 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 it's uh, very, very interesting topic certainly to, to, to discuss and to explore. Uh, at Harvard, we have uh, at, at the Ukrainian Research Institute, we have a pro project which is called MAPA, Digital Atlas of Ukraine, and one of the modules of it dealt with the uh, putting on the map the um, uh, information about the attitudes of the population toward language, toward history, culture, war, and so on and so forth, uh, on the basis of the of the uh, oblasts or regions in Ukraine before the start of the war in 2014 and then after the start of the war and what impact it had the war had on those on those attitudes. Uh, one thing that we noticed was that the uh, Russian annexation of the Crimea, the war in the Donbas, they produced. Uh, quite a significant spike in self reporting of people that they were switching toward Ukraine. Uh, it also, our data showed that it didn't last for uh, too long in the sense that that self-reporting went back more or less to the level where it was before once the immediate threat, threat disappeared. It will be interesting to see what is what is happening and how lasting the changes that are happening today. But just on the, on the anecdotal level, when you hear the mayor of um, Russian speaking, mayor of the Russian speaker, of Kharkiv saying that the, 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 the level of uh, hatred of the Russian aggression and in Russia as, as, as the country that certainly stays behind it in Kharkiv is today higher than it ever been in Western Ukraine, which is considered to be the hotbed of Ukrainian nationalism. 
Um, well, the, 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 I don't know whether this is true or not, but that's that's something to look at and look at the war and its impacts on the on the language practices. But again, on the anecdotal level, I, I see that more and more people actually are making a conscious choice to switch to Ukrainian and just saying that I, I don't want to be associated in any way with, with the country, with the army that is doing things like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. I know that we took a little bit more of your time, but I felt like it was one of those important myths to, to bust, I think. Um, so thank you very, very much, Professor Foy. That was in incredibly, um, incredibly relevant, but also in incredibly informative um, as well. Um, thank you to everybody for all of the interesting questions. I'm really sorry that we couldn't answer all of them, um, but as you know, there are two more lectures to come. So we'll have one um, in two days time on the 24th at the same time, and that will look at the making of the Soviet people. So we'll move forward slightly in terms of the, the historical the historical period. But for now, um, I will let you go. Professor Lucky, we've taken up lots of your time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and thanks thanks for everyone who attended and thanks for excellent questions, especially those based on the readings. I see that the, the, uh, you did your readings, you did your preparation for this for this discussion. And I look forward to reconnecting with you what, in a couple of days. It's somewhere in my calendar. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye. Goodbye everybody. Bye.